Okay, so uh, good morning everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mohamed Amin uh, here in Lisbon. Uh, so Mohamed is a chief scientist at UAF Systems, uh, the quantum computing company, as you know, and he's also a joint faculty at the Simon Fraser, Fraser uh, University in, in Canada. Um, thank you very much for coming and for uh, letting us know what's going on inside your uh, processes. This is very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to give you some introduction to adiabatic quantum computation and quantum annealing and also to the wave uh, machine that uh, we have been building. Uh, there's going to be some shuffling around because I had some discussions yesterday with uh, uh, Yasser what's more interesting to you guys and <clears throat> so I apologize if I don't follow completely the, the presentation I may just skip something or, or open a new presentation so don't worry also I want to uh, ask you guys I would like this to be interactive so ask questions I may ask you questions so be, be very comfortable about uh, asking questions or, or anything you don't understand it's okay okay so uh, Uh, as I said, the solution is that the uh, quantum computation depends on quantum evolution, and quantum evolution, as you all know, depends on base, is based on Schrodinger equation. So Schrodinger equation uh, has a Hamiltonian, which applies to a wave function, and uh, that describes the evolution of the wave function. But you can also de define an evolution operator. So you guys know all of these, which, which for time-independent Hamiltonian is just an exponentiation of the Hamiltonian. So in gate model quantum computation, you use Hamiltonian as only to apply gates. So you're, you have no Hamiltonian or unit Hamiltonian, nothing it does. You apply a Hamiltonian for time delta t, that applies a gate, whether it's a single qubit gate, two qubit gate, and then you turn it off, and then it turns on and off again. So, but uh, the concept of using Hamilton in, in adiabatic quantum computation is different. In adiabatic quantum computation, you use the eigenstates. And so, what does a Hamiltonian do to eigenstates? Any answer? No. Nothing. So a Hamiltonian does nothing to the eigenstate. So the, only a phase changes, which is, it doesn't matter after all. So, and because of that, a Hamiltonian is kind of a stabilizer for the eigenstate itself, which we will get to that later. So what, the way adiabatic quantum computation works is you write a Hamiltonian that has some initial Hamiltonian when s is equal to, to zero. So s is now time div 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 divided by the total time of evolution. <coughs> and so you start your, your, for your uh, system in the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian and you let the system, let s evolve from zero to one. And at the end, if you are lucky and you stay in the ground state, at the end, you get to the ground state of the final Hamiltonian, which gives you the solution. So you design your problem, you design your system this way. But I said that if you are lucky, so, so how lucky should you be? And how to determine if you're lucky or not? That, that is based on something called adiabatic theorem which tells you that the time scale that you have to evolve your system should scale as one over gap square. But how does that work? <laughs> Let's uh, look at uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty relation between time and energy. So you guys have seen this, I'm pretty sure. So can you tell me what is this delta E? This is, I don't know. 
uncertainty of energy. What does it mean in terms of eigenstates? In terms of eigenstates, what does it mean? If, if, you have, if you have one eigenstate, what's the uncertainty of energy? If your wave function is one eigenstate, what's the uncertainty of energy? Zero. So uncertainty in energy means superposition. Whenever you have superposition, you have uncertainty in energy. Superposition in deep energy basis. So what does time mean? Oh, I already, I already <laughs> showed you the answer. So the time, the time means the, the time scale that, that the process you're looking at takes. And uncertainty relation relate the time scale of the process with the uncertainty of energy of your wave function during this process. So how, how can you relate this with this adiabatic theorem? Let's look at a problem with two, a Hamiltonian with two lowest eigenstates. We, we ignore the other eigenstates. And imagine you, are, you start from the ground state and then you reach this, this small gap regime. During the evolution, there is a time scale that you, you stay in this gap regime. I call it delta t. Within this time scale, you will stay there, and then you, you pass it. OK? So you now know, know what, what delta t is. But you want to be stay in the ground state. So you want to not have superposition. So therefore, you want to have no uncertainty of the energy. And there, because of the gap, you want the uncertainty of the energy to be smaller than the gap. Am I right? You, want, you don't want to occupy this state, therefore uncertainty should be smaller than the gap. So therefore, if I just use this, this uncertainty relation and then I, I say I want the uncertainty of energy to be smaller than the gap, it tells me that the time scale that I, I spend in this region should be larger than H divided by the gap. But I showed it this gap squared, so how does gap squared come in? The gap squared comes in because this, the ratio of this delta t with the total time, the, the ratio of this, this region to the total time is the ratio of the gap to the total energy when you have an anti-crossing. Therefore, if I use this formula relating delta t to the, the total time, and then I use uncertainty relation, I get the, the adiabatic theorem just using uncertainty relation. So, but I, I could also do better. So I, now, now I'm assuming that I'm, I'm going uniformly from the beginning to the end. And therefore, I spend the ratio, the, the, the time here, based on this distance, this, this time scale, compared to this time scale, the ratio. But I could do it differently. I could go fast, spend maximum time in the middle, and go fast again. And the best I can do is what? The best I can do is I can just jump here, I spend all the time here, jump here. So therefore, the best I can do is I can spend all of my TF, all of my time in this region. Then I will get a, a, another uh, dependence of time to gap, which is now it's not a square. It is one over gap. And I know it's optimal. So if you look, look at this literature, you see that the people spend a like few pages to, to, to prove these two things. But you see, you can get them directly from uncertainty relation. And now you know this is optimal. It's a, it's a proven mathematically optimal, but this is you, with just simple explanation from, AD, from uncertainty relation, you see, you see the optimality. OK, so you can look at this differently. Uh, I, yesterday, I, for those who, who were in the meeting yesterday, I mentioned about uh, landau zinner problem. landau zinner problem is a problem that you have a, a Hamiltonian like this in which the sigma x term is, is constant and the sigma z term changes linearly with time. And 
If you plot this Hamiltonian, you get, you get a, actually, if you plot the eigenness, the two eigenness of this Hamiltonian, you get actually a, a, a picture exactly like this. It turns out that Landau and Zinner showed in, in, I think in the 30s, that this problem has a, an exact solution when if at t minus infinity, the probability of being in the ground state is zero, is, is one, which means the probability of being in the excited state is zero. At t equals plus infinity, you get this probability. And now if I, instead of going from minus infinity to infinity, I restrict my time, you can, you can convince yourself that now the, the rate of change will be the, the ratio of EF divided by T. If you think about it, you can convince yourself. And you again get, get exactly the, the, the equation that I got from uncertain relation. So this is a, another way of getting a adiabatic theorem. But if you want to be more mathematic, you can also express it as a theorem. And there's a lot of papers who have shown this theorem. And there's a lot of actually confusion about adiabatic theorem and controversy, whether it holds and it doesn't hold. And uh, I am also part of that controversy. But uh, there's also other, other versions of the theorem which are more, more rigorous. But for you, just understanding based on uncertainty, I think that that's enough. So what I talked about was adiabatic quantum uh, computation in general, but what you can do with this type of computation? You can do, in my opinion, you can do two things. One is optimization, because at the end you get the ground state of your final Hamiltonian, therefore you're optimizing something. So, so the most natural thing to do with this kind of algorithm is optimization. But you can also do universal quantum computation. I may, uh, I'm going to skip this now, but at the end of my talk, if, I, if we have time, we can get to this universal quantum computation. That's also very interesting, I think, to you guys. Uh, I will spend more time in, in adiabatic optimization and quantum annealing. So in adiabatic quantum optimization and quantum annealing, the only th restriction that you have for your Hamiltonian is that your initial Hamiltonian, which I, or driver Hamiltonian, is all off diagonal, and your final Hamilton is all diagonal in the, in the computation basis, in the measurement basis, in the basis that you care about. And typically, there's also confusion what's quantum annealing, what's adiabatic quantum computation. So in my opinion, you can distinguish them. Adiabatic quantum computation, you, you use the word adiabatic, that means you don't exchange any energy with the system. That means you have to stay in the ground set from the beginning to the end. If you relax this, this, this definition and you allow your system to also get excited and thermally or non-adiabatically and go to excited state, go back, you get very similar computation scheme. We can call it quantum annealing because it's not adiabatic anymore. But they are, they're actually very similar thing. So, <clears throat> So far, I, I wrote this Hamiltonian as linear interpolation between these two uh, different Hamiltonians, 1 minus S and S. But that doesn't have to be linear interpolation. And indeed, making this is, is not easy. It's much easier to just, just make a generalized Hamiltonian with two coefficients, A and B. And that's what we actually built at d -way. So what we build at D-Wave is, is basically a Hamiltonian that has a, the initial Hamiltonian, which is all sigma x, with some coefficient delta, which is basically tunneling. Yasser yesterday said he likes, I talk about tunneling all the time, but that, that's what physically happens in the system, so tunneling is... But actually, if, if, you, if you think in terms of a spin, there's no tunneling. There's a spin in sigma x, a spin in, in sigma z. But when you talk, talk about superconducting uh, qubits, this is tunneling. So I will get back to that. 
But if you want to think in terms of a spin, this is, this is like a, a field in the x direction. And, but we also uh, make a, the final Hamilton in a specific way, and the specific way is a, an icing Hamiltonian with a uniform, with a, a, a the field applied to every qubit and coupling between some of, some of the qubits based on the graph, which I will tell you later what the graph is. So these two coefficients, as I said before, are not 1 minus s and s, are some function of s, and this is, this is how the function looks like in, in, in a particular machine that we have built. This is a, these two functions are extract, extracted from measurement uh, of a, a machine. But as you can see, a, a delta starts from a very large uh, number, 8 gigahertz, and then goes to zero. But e, which is the coefficient of the final Hamilton, starts from a small number, a small energy, and goes to a large energy. And it does what we expected to, to do, if we build it correctly. But how can we build such a machine that does this? So, so do you guys know about circuit theory, yeah? Uh, you, know, you know capacitance, inductance. So it's basically the same thing. We have three basic circuit elements. The first thing is capacitance, and you know the energy of the a capaci capacitor is one-half capacitance voltage squared or charge squared divided by 2C. We have also inductance. I usually you, you, you represent inductance by just some solenoid thing, but I, I, I represent it by a loop, because that's what we have. So if we have a loop with a flux phi through the loop, the energy of the, the inductance, the inductive energy is, again, 1 half Li squared, well, L is an inductance, or phi squared divided by 2L. As you know, but the, the, the only new thing which I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with is, or not, is Josephson Junction. Have, have you heard of Josephson Junction? Okay. So Josephson Junction is a, a circuit element is in superconductors. It can only exist in superconductors. What it is, is basically a tunnel junction. In, in a metal, you have tunnel junction. You have a, an insulator between two pieces of metals that electrons can tunnel. If these metals become superconductor, then Cooper pair can tunnel, because superconductor is a Cooper pair between two electrons in opposite momentum. So, but Josephson junction, when you, when you couple two superconductors via a, an insulator, very thin insulator. It has very interesting property which was discovered by Josephson. <clears throat> and that is the current through the junction depends on the phase across the, the junction. And therefore the energy of a Josephson junction is some constant times cosine of the phase. Just take it as a fact. Uh, I don't expect you to get more than this. But, but superconductors have this property. And actually that's the basis of superconductivity, that the whole superconductor have a, a constant phase, a uniform phase, which, which in metals you don't have. Every electron has its own phase, incoherent phase. But in superconductor, the whole condensate, the whole, all of the electrons have a one phase. And so if you have a, a junction, and if, if the phase in this side of the junction is different from the phase in this side of the junction, you get an energy which depends on the phase difference. That's all. OK, how can you use this? Any question up to this point? Everything clear? OK. So now imagine I, I connect all these three together. So I have a, a loop a Josephson junction and a capacitor. The energy will be the sum of these three energies. Yeah? My energy becomes the charging energy, Q squared divided by 2C, 
flux energy or magnetic energy and Josephson energy. But I have some other properties that I have take, to take into account. The first property is I know, do you know about Arnold Bohm effect? Have you heard of it? So when a charge turns around the flux, it gains a phase. Yeah? Now a Cooper pair has two charges. When two charges go around the flux, gain a phase. So now imagine I, I have two a Cooper pair starting from here and going around and coming back here. It gains a phase. But I know that the phase should be two pi periodic. Am I right? So therefore, the phase that it, it gains because of this flux should be exactly equal to the phi. So that I get two, two pi, or, or with, with, with two pi differences. And this is called flux quantization. So the, the, the phase across this junction is not independent from the flux. And there's a, a relation like that. There's also another relation, and you know, you know Faraday's law. Faraday's law tells you that the derivative of flux is voltage. So therefore, the, I can also relate, and voltage is Q divided by C, charge divided by capacitance. I can also relate Q and flux. I can therefore write everything in terms of flux. I have one equation that has the a term proportional to flux, derivative of flux squared, and a term proportional to uh, a term depending on, on flux. But now I, I remind you the Newtonian mechanics. The energy is kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is one half mass x dot squared, and potential energy is some v, is some function of x. Now, if you compare this, these two, you see that there's a, a, a very similar uh, similarity. X is actually replacing the role of uh, phi flux is replacing the role of position. So there's a actually I can actually generalize this, this similarity and uh, the position in in, uh, in in particles. You know, position, mass, momentum. You know the commutator relation in, in quantum mechanics, and everything actually completely one to one exists for flux and charge. The, the position now is, is, is flux, the mass is charge, momentum is actually, the, the mass is actually capacitance, the momentum is charge, and the uncertainty relation that you had between position and momentum exactly holds between flux and charge. And kinetic energy and potential energy also look, look, look very similar. Therefore, you can actually ex expect that what you know about a particle quantum dynamics can hold in this circuit, also, although this, there's no particle, but you can think of flux as a particle now in your imagination. Okay, now, <clears throat> if I look at the, the Hamiltonian that I have, so the, this is the kinetic part. I, I told you charge is momentum now. Charge is momentum, flux is position, yeah? So it's momentum squared divided by two mass and a potential energy, uh, which is a function of flux. Now, I, I, in addition to this flux, I, I'm applying some external flux as well, uh, phi x. So therefore, this, I'm shifting the center of mass of, of this uh, particle. So now, look at this, this equation. I have a, a parabola and I have a cosine. If I have a parabola, and I have a cosine, and I adjust I adjust the two so that this, the peak of the cosine 
happens at the bottom of the problem, and I add the two, I will get something like this. Am I right? So if I focus on the lower part of this, I get a double load potential. So by, by adjusting this external flux in such a way, so this, this external flux moves the parabola, left and right. By adjusting the position of this parabola on the maximum of the cosine function, then I can make a double load potential. And if I actually, indeed, if I move it back and forth, I can tilt the double load potential. Am I right? OK, so now I have a, basically, now in this picture, I have a double load potential, but the minimum of double load potential is at position that, that are a little bit away from this, 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 this center point, which is half flux quantum. And when you go away, you're actually in, inducing flux through the, the, this, this loop and inducing actually current, which, is, which, which we call persistent current. So the two minima of this double world potential correspond to, to counterclockwise and clockwise circulating current. And we call this zeros and one. So we have logical zero and one, which is based basically the bottom of these two. But now, if you, if you think of this, again, back to, back to particle uh, way of thinking, a flux trapped here can, can tunnel back and forth as long as the barrier is not too high, can, can tunnel under the barrier. And this tunneling gives me some like off-diagonal term in my Hamiltonian, while the diagonal term is the, the, the bias between the two, the left, left and right. And now, in order to have a, a controllable qubit, I have to be able to tune both of these coefficients, the, the coefficient of sigma z and the coefficient of sigma x. So how can I do that? I told you how to do this one. I told you how to do this one. I, I told you if I shift the, the, the center of the parabola, left and right, instead of a double will with, with degenerate uh, bottom, I get tilted double wall. You can, you can imagine how it works. So I can easily do, do, do the bias part. But how can I do the, 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 the change the tunneling amplitude? In order to change the tunneling amplitude, I have to, to change the barrier. The larger the barrier, the higher the barrier between, between the two wells, the lower the tunneling amplitude I will get, naturally. So how can I do that? It makes a little bit circuit. Uh, OK, for now. I can make the circuit a little bit more complicated. I can make a loop with two Josephson junctions replacing the one, one Josephson junction. You can work through it. I, you know Josephson junction is just a cosine phi. You can work through it, and you find that Basically, what this gives you is, is a tunability of, of the barrier. I don't want to get into the, the details, but you can do it yourself. So once I do that, then I have, I have the potential to actually change both barrier height and the bias, and then I have a single qubit completely tunable in the way I want. OK. Now I want to do, and I, I, I built this whole thing to make to do annealing, yeah? So now I want to do annealing. How do I do annealing? As I said, in the annealing, I want the, the tunneling term, the sigma x term, start from a very large value and go to zero. And I told you tunneling depends on barrier height. So in order to kill the tunneling, I have to raise the barrier, okay? So I will start from a monostable, and raise the barrier from zero to a, a large value, large enough that the tunneling base is basically zero between the, the, the two minima. And, but once I do that, I also, 
I'm not only changing the barrier, I'm also changing the energy scale. Because as you, as I, I'm just schematically plotting this, you, you see that as I raise the barrier, even if, if the flux that I'm applying, so I, I, here I had two fluxes. One of them is phi one, which is supposed to change the bias, sigma x term, and the other one is phi two, which is supposed to raise the barrier. Even if I, if I keep this phi one constant, I get the behavior like this. I, as I, in, I am increasing the barrier height, I'm also increasing the energy scale, which was what I wanted also. You remember, I, I wanted to change the energy, the, reduce the energy scale of sigma x, but increase the energy scale of sigma z at the same time. So it seems that it, 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 it is working to our favor. I, I get both of them within, with one, uh, with one knob, but it's, it, is a, it is more complicated than that. I don't want to get into this. What happens is, uh, maybe I don't get into it. I don't want to confuse it. So, so what happens is, is uh, uh, as, as I change the barrier, as, as I change this energy scale, I'm changing persistent current, but it happens that the, 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 the terms that I get for sigma z changes different, change differently as terms that, that, I, that I get for coupling sigma z, sigma z term. And in order to, to make this thing completely uniformly change, I had to add a lot of other circuits. So the, the actual queue is a lot more complicated than what I showed you. That all, that's all I want to say. So what, I, what we do is, so uh, this loop is a qubit. And this is the Joseon junction that I, that I showed you. But now you see, instead of two Joseon junctions, we have four, four Joseon junctions. And the reason we have four is, if these two are not exactly the same, as, because you, when you fabricate these Joseon junctions in, in any factory, any, you, you get some variations. And if these two are not exactly the same, it will screw up what we, we want to do. So we have to be able to tune them to be exactly the same. Therefore, we make it four and then tune them to be the same. We also have something we call we saw a persistent current compensator, which, which, which deals with what I, I just told you, to make J and H terms uniformly change together. We have L tuners, which is basically when you couple one qubit to another qubit, the inductance of the, the other qubit changes the, the inductance of this qubit. And you have to, in order to make the qubit robust and not change, you have to compensate that. We have some magnetic inductance computer, and we have some readout circuit. So the, the, the actual qubit is, is much more complicated than what I told you, but the basic physics is the same, okay? That's all I, all I, want, I, I want you to take from this. And the couplers are also look, look, look very similar to Qubit, but I, I don't want to get into that. Okay, now, <clears throat> now I have another problem. So I, I, I solve all of these problems. I have a, an, my ideal cube, but I have another problem. Every qubit now, you see, I have one control line here, some control lines here, some control lines changing these, these fluxes, some control lines changing these, some control lines changing. So every qubit, like, needs 10 lines. And if I have 500 qubits on the chip, and we actually now no, are making 4,000 qubits, even 500 qubits on the chip, each qubit wants 10, 10 lines. I need 5,000 lines. Even if I can make the, uh, bring 5,000 lines on the chip, I cannot connect it to it. So how can I put 5,000 lines on the chip of this size? This is a serious problem, which, which, which uh, the, everybody who is working uh, seriously on quantum computing, you have to think about this. You know, if you want to make a million gate model quantum computer, how are you going to control it? So the way we did it, we do it, we are lucky because in adiabatic quantum computation, everything is static. And we only have to change one thing, which was the barrier height. The rest is a static. 
all these H and J's and everything is static. If I change the barrier height, everything will work. Because everything is static, I can do, I can program the, the chip before I do annealing statically. I can, I can in, in serially, you know, I have a few lines and I, I send, so the, the way that the circuit works, I, they send pulses and every pulse creates single flux quantum and then single qu flux quantum go everywhere and then create fluxes. It's a very complicated circuit. But anyway, they, they, they are doing, I'm not doing it, it's very complicated, they are doing it. So therefore, on top of this, we built the circuits that, superconducting digital circuits that control this, statically control this. And because of that, we can actually program the chip with only, only 100, I think of the order of 200 lines we have. We can program all the chip, even 4,000 Q that we have with, with 200 lines, we can, we can control. Okay, so now get to the uh, actual qubits. This is a unit cell of our systems. You, you may not see much here, but you know, in, instead of making qubits like a dot and, and couplers connecting them, we actually extend the qubits. So every, if you see this, this line, do you see it? This is one qubit. And this line is another qubit. So there's a loop here which you don't really see. And so one keyword is like this, a, a loop here. And every qubit, we call this, these are, these are vertical qubits. You have four vertical qubits, four horizontal qubits. Every vertical qubit is coupled to four horizontal qubits at this corner. These are couplers. At the corner, the four vertical qubits are coupled to four horizontal qubits. But vertical qubits are not coupled to vertical qubits. It's a bipartite graph. And then in each year, so this is, this, this is now 128 qubit chip. Each unit cell is connected to the next unit cell horizontally only by horizontal qubit. This, this horizontal qubit is coupled to this horizontal qubit. This vertical qubit is coupled to this vertical qubit, and these are couplers. These, these orange things are couplers. And this is the 512 qubit chip. Now we have 4,000 qubit chip, but it, it's not working yet, but I, I could actually put that also in. Uh, this is a wire bonded chip, so this, these are wires. And these wires actually are, are thinner than your hair. So it's a, an, an art actually to, to put all these wires. But this is, uh, as I said, this is of the order of 200 wires. But imagine if we wanted to put 5,000 wires, it was basically impossible. And this is the, the chip. The chip goes actually here, and this, is, this, is, this, this goes to the fridge. These are dilution fridges, and they, they take the temperature down to 10 millikelvin. So this thing goes inside the dilution fridge. And so all of these are done by our experimentalists. You as a user, you don't even see these. You know, the, the Google machine is NASA, is in NASA. And Google is in, in, uh, is in uh, Monte, uh, Mountain View. But Google is in LA, the, the guys in LA. But the, the interesting thing is, the, the, we have two machines. The ISI machine, which is in USC, is in walking distance from Google. But the Google machine is in, <laughs> in, in San Francisco, in Mountain View. But anyway, so you don't really need, you don't need to know anything about anything. So what you really need is one line of code, depending on, on what, uh, program you use. I, I use MATLAB, so for me, this is, this is the magic line of code. So I sit and write my, my MATLAB, everything, and then I add one line. And what this one line does, it determines the solver, which is I want this particular machine. Uh, 
depending in, in, in DBA we have few of these, so we can choose, but in, if you are working at Google, it's only one machine that you can actually access to. You introduce H and J. H and J's are the coefficients of sigma Z and sigma and the coupling. You, you introduce a vector and a matrix, basically. And, and then you introduce some parameters, and these parameters, are, you see what they are. So I, I, I'm asking that I need the machine to run this H and J, this Hamiltonian, a thousand times, and I want it to, to give me all a thousand answers with 20 microsecond annealing time, I can adjust it up to like, I think 20 millisecond, from 20 microsecond to 20 millisecond. I want to do the minimum, the 20 microsecond. I want it to give me a histogram so that if, if a solution comes like a thousand times, I don't want a thousand solution. I want it to tell me just one solution and give me, tell me it came a thousand times. So this gives me a histogram. These are some time, time schedule yeah, you don't need to worry about thermalization time and readout thermalization time. You can, you can also adjust these, but you don't really. You can put the default. And they also auto, auto scale because uh, the, there is a limit how large you can choose H and J. And if you choose it like a thousand, then the, the machine will blow up. But you have to <laughs> either you control the, your the H and J or ask the machine to, to limit it to the maximum. So if, if you choose other scale, whatever you choose, the machine limits it to the maximum that, that it, it is allowed. Okay, <clears throat> and then once I do that, I get the solution. This, this answer is the solution. These are the solutions, these are the energies, and these are the occupation. How many times I, I got it, that solution. That's all. So as a user, you only need, you need this, this line. So it's very easy for, an experiment, for a theorist to become an experimentalist. Okay. Uh, okay. What about the coins? I'm going to actually skip this part. Uh, we discussed this a little bit. I'm going to skip this part. If we have time, I can come back to this part later and uh, uh, talk about this. How much time do I have? Okay. So how much time do I have for the first part? Okay, maybe I can give you one. I, I want to talk about two experiments. I give you one experiment, and we get take a break. I talk about the second experiment, which is entanglement. And then if you have time, we either cover this or go to universal AQC. So I will skip these. So, <clears throat> the purpose of this experiment, uh, this experiment we did actually, the, I think uh, it was published, I think, 2013, but we did it like two years before. It, it took us like more than a year and a half to, to get it published. You know, it's very difficult for us to publish things. But well, finally we got it. Uh, and the main idea we, we had, Sergey Bokshev from, from D-Wave used, and his paper was published before us. <laughs> What's that? From Google. From Google, yeah. From Sorry, from Google. Like uh, he, he, was from, he was from ISI, yeah. Okay. From ISI. From University of South California. Yeah. Back then, he was in ISA. But the, the idea was <clears throat> uh, how temperature affects quantum annealing in multi-qubit system, in a multi-qubit system. We had some, some experiments with one, one qubit, and uh, I mentioned yesterday to you guys that, that uh, at, at zero temperature, Landau's inner probability does not depend on, on environment. I, 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 told you yesterday. But that, that's, we have verification of that single qubit. But how about one multi-qubit? Does this still hold? And uh, also some other observation we had, which actually 
When you have a situation that the gap is very small, actually temperature can help you. And here is why. Uh, imagine this gap is very small, and imagine you anneal very fast. You, you, you cross the anti-crossing very fast. So that the Landau's the probability is one. You, you, get, you get up here with the probability almost one. If you don't have any environment, you get probability zero of the ground state. Because you, you just go up there quickly. If you have an environment, environment can actually excite the system up. It can occupy this excited state before the anti-crossing. And because you pass this anti-crossing completely non-adiabatically, whatever you have here goes there. So in the, in the cases of the gap, when the gap is very small, temperature can help you. And so you predict actually that if temperature was zero, you had completely ideal, uh, coherent situation, the probability of actually solving the problem was zero, almost zero. But as you increase temperature, the probability actually goes up, up to some peak. And the reason you have this peak, because then if you, if you raise temperature large enough, you will occupy these states. And these states may take you away from the ground state. So up to the temperature that you occupy these states, you expect that your probability should increase. And after that, it should decrease. So this was a prediction we had, and we wanted to test it. In order to test it, we needed some, some problem with very, very a small gap. And uh, Neil Dixon actually was uh, uh, the one who came up with this problem. And then this, is, this was a problem that actually Sergey Bokshaw used, and his paper was published like, a few months before <laughs> our paper, although we did it like a year before him. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea is, Imagine you have a, a, a problem, a graph like this, and these are 16 qubits coupled to each other, all ferromagnetically. If you don't have environment, if, if, sorry, if you don't have any bias, these all qubits are ferromagnetic, therefore all up and all down are the ground state. Then you apply some biases in a specific way that in one orientation, you get only one ground state, but in the other orientation, it doesn't matter if you flip the qubits or not. So, so bias and coupling cancel each other. So therefore, you get actually 256 states. And then we, we bias this to, to form the, the excited state. If this becomes the excited state, this becomes the ground state. And it happens that, that as you move away from the, the end of the Hamiltonian, <clears throat> these degenerate states repel each other. It's called <clears throat> level repulsion. <clears throat> and the, the lowest one actually crosses the ground state, and you get a very small anti gap anti crossing. So it, you get a, a gap which is basically a few thousand times smaller than temperature. Very small gap. <clears throat> So now the question we had is, can we solve a problem with such a small gap, which is, which is almost 2,000 times smaller than temperature? And it turns out that we can, actually. Uh, let us skip this part. As I said, we, we predict that this, this, the probability of solving this problem should be zero if we didn't have environment. But as you increase environment, as you increase temperature, probability should increase. Unfortunately, we cannot take the temperature to zero, but we can start from the, the minimum. And this is what we got. We got, these are different curves. This is probability of finding the system in the ground state. Different curves which are different annealing times from 500 milliseconds to 10 microseconds. And you see for, as this for the middle ones, you see clearly that it goes up and goes down exactly as we predicted. And actually the maximum is, is around 40 millikelvin, which is almost around this gap between these excited states. If you remember in 
our prediction, we said, we predict that the, the peak happens when you start occupying these states. And it actually does exactly what we predicted. And so, as I said, I, unfortunately, we cannot take the temperature to zero. But I, I told you a prediction before that, that uh, at zero temperature, we predict that the system behaves exactly as Landau Zinner, as completely closed system Landau Zinner. So we just tried it because we cannot take the, the, the temperature to zero. We just extrapolated these curves to zero. And then we got some points. And then we compared it with Landau Zinner. And it turns out actually, this extrapolation to zero, it turns out actually these are the points, extrapolated points. Now, now instead of plotting as a function of temperature, I'm plotting as a function of time. These are the, the these circles are the, these are squares from that angle, I, can, I, I cannot say. These squares are this extrapolation to zero temperature. And this dotted line is Landau's inner formula. And you see very nicely they agree with each other. I don't think it's a coincidence so that there is something in it, but it's, it's it is not very rigorous, I should say. This is just, just extrapolation. But even simple extrapolation to zero temperature works so well. So, okay. I think that's it. So this is, this is one experiment that confirming the, even with, with the environment, we, can, we not only can solve problems with very small gaps, we actually the system uses temperature to solve these problems, and it's an important, actually, to have temperature for these type of problems. I think it's a time, good time to have a break, and after the break, I can talk about entanglement and also talk about universal uh, quantum computation. Good. This is a, a work we did and published this year about uh, entanglement, and uh, before I start, I want to emphasize that there are two types of entanglement you can think of. One is eigenstate entanglement. You may have a, a system that its eigenstates are entangled, but when you mix them, your density matrix is not entangled. But the eigenstates are entangled. You may also have entanglement even in the mixed state. So you may mix them, but still preserve entanglement. So, which of these is more important for adiabatic quantum computation? I think the first one is more important. But here we, we, we show both of them in, in the experiment I'm going to present to you. Uh, we had the, when we did this experiment, you know, the, because we knew that we, had, we were going to have difficulty with the, the referees, we tried our best to, to not show it in one argument. Also, come up, I, I'm mentioning three, actually we have four. We have four levels of arguments. And yet we had difficulty with publishing. And every <coughs> level of these arguments, there are science papers published. So even that the first one, there are science papers published showing entanglement only based on anticrossing. And there's the papers that's showing entanglement based on witnesses, entanglement witnesses. And so we have anticrossing witnesses and still didn't get into nature. We published in, in uh, PRX in the end after so many fights with nature and science and nature nanotechnology. But anyway, <clears throat> let's get into it. Uh, imagine you have a, a, a bunch of qubits or spins coupled to each other ferromagnetically. If they're coupled to each other ferromagnetically, you know that the, without any tunneling, without any, any, any transverse field, the ground state is uh, either all up or all down, and the first excited state, if j is large enough, is, is the other one. 
And as I, if I change H, which is the bias applied to all qubits, I can actually make one of them favored versus the other one. And at H equals to zero, both of them are degenerate. Now, if I introduce tunneling, then this crossing becomes anti-crossing. And you know that at the, uh, at the center of this anti-crossing, the wave function will be superposition, or some people call it bounding and anti-bounding states. Superpositions of this all up and all down. And this superposition, we know it's entangled. It's actually called GHZ states, maximally entangled state. So, based on this, actually a lot of people actually have, have used this level of argument, that they, they make this kind of situation that you get this anti-crossing and they show this gap is, exists. And just showing this gap is a, uh, an, an, a proof, or an evidence, not, not a proof, an evidence of that you have entangled eigenstates. And there are a few science papers I can show that this, this is what's done. But you know, <clears throat> being careful and uh, the, the, not wanting to fight with the referees, we said, okay, so is there any actually a theorem to, to prove that? So you see this intuitively hold, like, uh, yeah, this, this has to be the case, but is, is there a theorem that proves it? And we couldn't find any. So we said, okay, before publication, let's prove ourselves that this, this theorem actually uh, holds. So I, I, I wrote a paper with Anatoly Smirnov and we showed that actually under some conditions which actually hold in our system and anti-crossing means entanglement. So that was the, 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 the first step. Uh, okay, so the first thing you can do is as, as the, the, the first evidence of the, there's an eigenstate entanglement is actually to look at anti-crossing. But to see anti-crossing, you need to actually see the spectrum. Also, in order to make the, the, the argument more rigorous, you have to show that this, this gap that exists here is done by tunneling, is, is open because of tunneling. So therefore, to show that is you remove tunneling and to show that the gap closes. So as you increase S, I showed you before that the, the coefficient of sigma x vanishes as a function of S, as a function of time. So as we move our Hamiltonian toward the end, this gap should close to zero because tunneling is removed. So that, that was our, the, the first thing we wanted to do. We wanted to show that this anti-crossing exists and the gap closes as a function of uh, an ailing parameter. So, but the, the, the first thing we had to do is was to, sh to show the spectrum, and nobody has ever shown a spectrum of a multi-qubit in a more than two qubit actually, and we wanted to show for eight qubit. And even for two for two qubits, people use microwave, and we cannot have microwave in our system. So we needed to be actually very innovative to to find a way to actually see the spectrum of a multi-qubit system, and. This was done actually by a technique we call tunneling spectroscopy. I'm going to tell you a little bit how, how it works. It's a, it's a very simple and elegant idea. I, I actually am very proud of this one. Uh, the way it works is the following. Imagine you have a, a, a system with some eigenstates. Yeah? And you want to see these icons. You want to, to observe these, the eigenstates. Imagine I add a one qubit I call prop qubit to one of the qubits of the system. It doesn't matter which one at this point. And I couple this key, these two qubits in, in a very specific way. So this Sigma ZP is the, the Pauli matrix, matrix of this prop qubit. And you see, with when Sigma ZP is minus one, this is zero, all right? And when this is zero, HS plus P is HS. 
So for one orientation of the probe qubit, the, the spectrum of the coupled Hamilton is exactly the spectrum of the system that I want to measure. So I, I actually separate the, the spectrum in, in two manifolds. One side, when, when the probe qubit is down, is exactly the spectrum of the system. The other side, when the probe qubit is up, this is plus one, plus one becomes plus two, then I, I'm actually modifying the Hamiltonian of the, of the system. So the other side is different. But I design the coupling and everything in such a way that on this side, I get one isolated state with a gap from the other states. So why do I do that? Now imagine I, I okay, so the other thing, the other very interesting thing is, I apply also a bias to this qubit. And by applying this bias, I'm actually moving this side up and down. Because as I said, this is zero. This side doesn't get affected by this term at all. So therefore, changing this epsilon p, I'm just moving the left side up and down. Am I right? Everything clear? OK, now imagine I, I start initialize my system on this red state on the left. Because of tunneling, the system can tunnel from left to any of these states. But tunneling is maximum when you are in resonance. You know, it's called resonant tunneling. When the, the two states are in resonance, are, 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 are at the same energy, tunneling is maximum. When you go away, tunneling decreases. So therefore, I can actually by changing this bias, I can actually move the left side up and down and look at the tunneling amplitude. And then every peak represents one of the eigenstates. And if you go back and look at this, going from left to right is basically flipping qubit, prop qubit from up and up to down. So I only need to measure one qubit. That's the beauty of it. By measuring one qubit, I can, I can actually, and I have to measure and repeat to get the probability. But by measuring one qubit, I can actually get the spectrum of all the qubits that, I, that are coupled to the, that, that particular qubit. OK. Uh, let's not worry about that. So this is a, a kind of experimental. Uh, uh, data of this, this tunneling. Every cross section is basically what I showed you. It goes up and down and up and down, and the, the, every peak is one eigenstate. Now, we change some parameters of the system, which is actually, in this case, this, this, this is a two qubit uh, uh, system with some coupling, uh, ferromagnetic coupling, therefore the two qubits are ferromagnetic, and I'm actually changing this H. This side is H. And the, every color is actually, uh, the rep color represents this tunneling amplitude of the, the, of the prop qubit, and whenever you see the color is, is, is going towards red, that's a peak. So now you see that you have a one state, which is ground state, and one state, which is the first excited state, and there's a gap. And this is an anti-crossing I talked about. So this, is, and this, this side is you have all down ferromagnetic. This side you have all up ferromagnetic ground state. And right in the middle, you get the superposition of all up and all down. This is the, yeah, this is the two qubit more clearly shown. You see the anti-crossings in the spectroscopy, and you see that, and here you, uh, I'm plotting the eigenstate as a function of the annealing parameter, and I told you, as I go towards the end of annealing, I'm actually removing tunneling, I'm actually removing transverse field completely, and without transverse field, there shouldn't be any entanglement, there shouldn't be any gap. And this actually justifies it, uh, this. I, as I go towards the end of any which S equals to 1, the gap actually closes. And this too, I think, is a compelling evidence that we have entangled eigenstates.
Uh, on top of that, you see that these lines, these are theoretical lines, and these are not fits. These are independently measured parameters put into a Hamiltonian, diagonalized, put on top of this, and they, they, they completely match. So now I'm actually confident that all of the parameters I have and the Hamiltonian I have is what I, I expect it to be, and they completely agree. This is a, a, a two qubit result. We also did the eight qubit result in a, in a specific uh, graph. This is a, a ring with, with, with four spokes. And the reason we have four spokes is because we wanted the, to push the excited states up. The, the more spokes you add, the more penalty you introduce by, if you go away from, from fermionic state. And but it doesn't matter. So in the end, it's a two eight qubit state, and then you get again very similar anticrossings. And again, at the center of the anticrossing, you have something very close to, or close enough to, this all up plus all, all down entangled state, or GH the state. And again, as you go away from the, the, the as you go toward the end of the annealing, when the tunneling uh, it's zero, you, the gap closes, and then again, I think this, this is a, a, a good evidence of having eight qubit entangled eigenstates. Again, the lines agree very well. Uh, the, the theoretical calculation agrees very well with experimental data. Okay, so that, uh, I think that that's the compelling evidence that this is ground set entanglement. We had also other, other uh, witnesses in the paper. I, I encourage you to, pay, to actually read that paper. I, I will give the link to uh, Yasser. Uh, we had uh, some actual other evidences and uh, witnesses that, that we have for uh, ground state entanglement. But how about mixed state? For mixed state, uh, you need more than eigenism, you need density matrix. And how, how do we know density matrix? Uh, we cannot do tomography, actually. We cannot do tomography, therefore we don't know density matrix. But we can actually measure populations. I will tell you how, you can, with the same technique you can measure population also. This, this tunneling spectroscopy is very powerful. You can measure population. Therefore, you know actually the diagonal part of the density matrix by measuring, but you don't know the off-diagonal part. The first thing we, we do is that we assume that the density matrix is diagonal because we know that from the theory that we know that the the, the decoherence makes the density matrix diagonal in the energy basis. We know from theory. Therefore, we know that it, this, these measurements are way past the decoherence time. Therefore, we know that the, the density matrix is diagonal. And we also we, we measure the diagonal elements, and they actually very, very nicely agree with Boltzmann distribution I will show you later. Therefore, everything seems to, to hold as the theories predict. Therefore, we assume basically diagonal density matrix with the measured diagonal elements. Uh, so, let me just skip these, these things. I, I, Let me ask you these things. Uh, th these are the explanation how we measure the population using the, the, uh, the technique. I think I can skip these. This is a, the, the measurement of population. This is two qubit system. This is the ground state population as a function of S, the, the annealing parameter. And these red lines are Boltzmann distribution. Again, this is not fit. This is Boltzmann distribution using the Hamiltonian of the system that we independently measure. And you see the, the measurement that we do actually agree very well with, with both in this question for both two qubit and eight qubit system. 
Now, if we now assume that the off diagonal elements are zero, that, that's, that's the first thing we do. Assume that the off diagonal elements are zero, and the, the assume that the, the dense matrix is diagonal, then we can actually write down the density matrix as a, a diagonal entity in, in the energy basis. And if you write down the, the density matrix, then you can actually use that density matrix to calculate some known measures or witnesses of entanglement. So some of them are, for, for two qubits, you can use concurrence. Concurrence is the, the most, mostly known uh, measure of entanglement for two qubits, which works for both, both open system and closed system. For multi qubit, then you have to do other things. So negativity is some, some actually a measure of entanglement that, that can be used. Uh, for multi qubit also. So these are the uh, results. These are results of calculation. This is calculation of entanglement witnesses and measures using the density matrix that we extracted from the, uh, and, uh, from the data, assuming that the di off diagonal are zero. And this is a, this is a negativity. This is two qubit. This is Con the red is concurrence, the black is negativity, and this blue is a witness that we, 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 we introduced ourselves as a, a witness of ground, uh, ground state entanglement. And all of them show that there's entanglement, and for both 2 qubit and, and for 8 qubit. So therefore, again, assuming that the density matrix is, is diagonal, we have confidence that, that we have entanglement. But then some skeptics may come, come and say, okay, so how do you know the density matrix is diagonal? I don't care about any theoretical prediction of it. You have to show me that the density matrix is diagonal. So this part, uh, we actually had to depend on another collaborator that is uh, Federico Espedialeri. Uh, he is at ISI at the University of Southern California. He actually showed that uh, the partial information you get from measuring the diagonal elements of the density is enough, actually, to, to, to give, uh, give you a bound on the off-diagonal and give you, give you a bound on the entanglement. I, again, this is a, a, a pretty complicated uh, thing to look at. I don't want to spend time here. And so, again, with his, he introduced a witness that uh, based on, on this, this, this uh, concept that you can actually know enough from the diagonal elements about the off-diagonal elements. Once you know diagonal elements, you know something about the off-diagonal elements. And from that, actually, he, he actually uh, showed that if the, if the he introduce a witness, and if the introduce, uh, witness is negative, you have entanglement. If the witness is positive, you don't know actually whether it's entangled or not. And these are the data we get from, from the, the, our system, the eight qubit system. And for most regimes, you are confident that you have entanglement, even without knowing the off element of density matrix. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, I think you guys will be interested in, in universal quantum computation also. So I want to uh, spend some time. So now I know, I know you are, uh, all of your theories, so this is a theoretical talk, and I think you, you guys relate to this better. So, so all, up to this point, I only talked about uh, <clears throat> uh, Adiabatic quantum computation as quantum annealing, as optimization. But one criticism is, okay, so this optimization is not, uh, there is no proof that there's exponential speed up in optimization, there's, they cannot do a Scholes algorithm or, or other, uh, other algorithms that are designed for gate model. And there was actually a, a proof uh, way back when, when actually adiabatic quantum computation was introduced by Aharnov et al. that, that adiabatic quantum computation is universal. And I think that for, for theorists, that's a very nice and interesting thing to, to look at. So imagine 
So what I want to show you is, is the equivalence between gate model and adiabatic quantum computation. Basically, how you map, how you can map a gate model quantum computation to adiabatic quantum computation, okay? So imagine you have a gate model algorithm. A gate model algorithm has, I call them UL. L goes from one to, one to L, capital L. You have initial state, and after each gate, you get a, a new state. So you get, this, after first gate, you get U1, U0, U2, U1, sorry, U2, U1, size zero, that's the second gate. After Lf gate, you get UL, U2, U1, U size zero. And after the final gate, you get UL, and this is your solution, yeah? That's how gate model works, all right? So these, call, these, these are set of called history states. So the history of your, your computation. Now, <clears throat> there, was a, there was an interesting observation, I think it was first made by Feynman, that you can actually think of this UL as a hopping operator. If, if, you, if you consider your state as a chain, yeah, so this is your initial state and go U1, U2, and U capital L. These ULs are, are like hopping operators. It just move you one step forward and move you one step backward. But there is also a, a problem here because this U does not only apply on, on, the, on U psi L minus 1, it applies on other side as well. But imagine it doesn't. Imagine that it does not apply on, on any other it only, only acts on this, this side that it, it, it's supposed to act. I will tell you how, how to do that later, but, but for now take it as given. Now, this Hamiltonian, which, which is only made by U and U dagger, looks like actually a, a, a particle on a, on a chain, yeah? It's actually a 1D one free, one free particle on a chain. Hamiltonian. It is, I don't know, you, are you guys familiar with it? Uh, creation and annihilation operator. This is a particle and a chain, and this AL dagger AL minus one is actually basically UL, and AL, AL minus one dagger is, is UL dagger. So whatever you know uh, about a particle and a chain, you can actually apply to this, this Hamiltonian. And actually, Feynman's original idea was, was the following. He said, imagine I, I actually in, introduce a wave pocket at the beginning of this chain, which by initializing in the first state. What happens if I just leave it and, uh, and Schrodinger equation acts on this? The wave pocket actually moves and you get actually a quantum walk to the end. You guys, we were talking about quantum walk yesterday. You can actually solve the problem this way. And by just making this Hamiltonian, you can actually solve the problem by, by making a, a quantum walk. But uh, this is not what we want to do, and uh, we want to actually use a, a do an adiabatic quantum computation, so, but we can actually use the same Hamiltonian. So the question is, what is the ground state of this Hamiltonian? Uh, let's look at, uh, let, let's make things a little bit simpler. Let's introduce a, a periodic boundary condition. Introduce another gate, which actually a, a resetting gate, which takes you from psi L to psi zero. So a resetting gate. I, I, I imagine that such a gate exists. It doesn't affect actually the, the result, but it makes the computation simpler. Now I have actually a particle on a, a ring. And you know that the, the, the way the, because it's a free particle, the wave function of this, the eigenstate of this, this system are plane waves, yeah? So 1D plane waves. And so therefore the eigenstate of this system are just simply just plane waves. Plane waves on, on this ring. Okay, so, ah, uh, this is a proof of how, how, how actually these are eigenstates. I, I think you can, all, all of you can do it yourself. I don't want to go through this. Okay, so 
the grounded state of this, of this uh, Hamiltonian is actually a, a uh, superposition of all. So this is, this is the eigenstate. And if k is equal to 0, I get just a uniform superposition of all of these psi l's. The uniform superposition of all these history states. I'm actually separating the, the, the final state from the rest. But again, this, this is uniform superposition. But you see, now I actually have an answer. This, this is the, uh, the solution I want. I have an answer, my, my solution, as one term in the, in the superposition. And that's enough for me. Uh, previously, I, uh, I wanted to get to the ground set with highest fidelity. But here, I, get, I only get a, a term inside the ground set that gives me the solution. And as, as long as this coefficient is polynomial, the, the amplitude is polynomial, I can actually repeat the experiment many times, and I, I, I can get this. So therefore, by repeating with probability 1 over L, the, by, by measuring with the probability 1 over L, I can actually find psi L, which is the solution to the problem I want. But in order to do that, you need to, you need to do projection measurement. So how can I do projection measurement in psi? If I knew psi L to do the projection measurement on that basis, then I already know psi L, so why, why should I measure? So how can I do projection measurement? And even if I do projection measurement, how, how can I know that I, I, I got the right result? And it, this is also goes back to the, the, the first idea. How can I make this U only act on the side that I want to act? All of this can be solved by adding some other qubits. So instead of having U plus U dagger, I add some qubits, they call it pointer qubits or clock qubits. Now, I, I'm actually entangling my system to some other qubits. But in such a way that these qubits have these, these, these states, L. Every L represents one stage of my computation. Now, if I do projection measurement on this qubit, then I know that I, I, I have measured the right state. So in other words, I know that my ground set is superposition of, of these terms, these entangled terms. If I measure psi L and I find it is capital L, then I know that my psi L, my psi L is also psi capital L, therefore it's, it's the solution. And also then you, you see that now every of these, these operators only act on one of these operators, one of these states and not on the other ones, any other ones. So these, I got everything that I needed to do this. Okay, so, <clears throat> now how, to, how do I uh, actually introduce this, uh, the, uh, this pointer states? The most natural or simple thing to do is just, just pick up a few qubits and, and, and choose them to be binary states. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and, and, and so on and so forth. But that's not a good way. The reason is, uh, in order, if, if I choose this, this way, in order to make operators like this, I require all qubits to, to couple to uh, every other qubit. And that is physically <coughs> not possible. So I wanted to make, I want to make this pointer qubit in such a way that I can generate these operators with minimum number of Pauli matrices, minimum number of, and it turns out that actually you can generate them with only one Pauli matrix. How? Imagine instead of, instead of doing that, I, I define pointer qubits this way. Zero is all zero, one is one zero zero, two is one one zero zero, and L is one 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 one, L ones and all zeros. Now, what is this operator? Let us see. Come on. What is this operator? This operator turns L to L, so L minus 1 to L, yeah? So basically, you, you need to only t flip one qubit. If I, if I flip one qubit, if I flip this qubit from 0 to 1, I go from L to L plus 1, am I right? By flipping one qubit, I can just go one step forward. And if I'm flipping one qubit 
from 1 to 0, I can go one step backward. So therefore, I can actually generate these, these operators by only this raising and lowering uh, Pauli matrices, tau plus and tau minus. Everything clear? OK, so now I, I basically have this, this the propagation Hamiltonian as just this ULs and tau, which, which, are, which, which flip the prop qubits. The other problem is I, I want to have some, I want to make sure that, that psi zero is the, the initial state that I, I want the system to initialize. For example, I, I want the algorithm initialized in, in zero, all zeros. Then I have to make sure that this is the psi zero that I, 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 I want. And in order to do that, I can introduce to the Hamiltonian a term that penalizes everything that is not, when, when, when the prop qubits are, are all in all zero states, force the logical qubits to be zero. But that's also easy because if you look at this, The first qubit is only zero here, and the rest is one. Therefore, the only qubit that I care is on the first qubit. Again, by looking at one qubit, I can also do this. It's very, very smart, actually. By looking at only the first qubit, I can make sure that when the first qubit is zero, then I, I force the, the logical qubits to be in, at, at zero state. By, by introducing this Hamilton. And again, this is, this is now a only two qubit interaction, Hamiltonian. Okay, now I have basically the, the everything. I have the, my propagation Hamiltonian. Oh, I, I didn't say one more thing. How, how can I actually make this, this, these states to be my prob states? I have to make these, only these states to be my prob state and the rest of the, the states be uh, the, so high in energy that they don't interfere with my calculation. And this, this goes back to what we discussed before. If I make a chain and I apply a bias in, in the end, I basically get a bunch of these states, completely degenerate. I only get one domain ball in the middle and then the domain ball can be anywhere and you get degenerate states. So this is exactly what we discussed before. So therefore, yeah, so the, the pointer is just a chain, ferromagnetic chain pointer qubit with, with just biases at the end. And I have the input Hamilton, the prop Hamilton. This, this becomes my problem Hamilton that I want to add. And then if I... Yeah, then I can actually do adiabatic evolution and it turns out the gap is actually uh, 1 over L squared and therefore the computation time is a, is a, a polynomial, uh, polynomial dependent on the uh, size of the gate model. So therefore you, you, whatever algorithm that is polynomial in gate model, it is polynomial in AQC as well. Uh, I think we will. I can, can stop here, yeah? Um, and, uh, thank you very much for very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. So, if you have any questions. Yes. So, um, how is the wave um, close to this universal? Uh, uh, okay, now you're, you're forcing me to go forward. <laughs> so it turns out that in, in order to have to do this, uh, let's just, this is an example of Hadamard gate and okay, so let's, 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 let's go back this way. Uh, you see, this ULs are gates in gate, uh, gate model, and they could be one qubit or two qubit gates, yeah? And 
So they are either one local or two local operators. Apply to two qubit or one qubit. And this tau is only applies to one qubit, then in total you get a three local Hamiltonian. In order to make, but three local Hamiltonian you, can, you cannot make, basically. Usually physics gives you two qubit interactions, it doesn't, doesn't give you three qubit interactions. It's, it's much harder to make three qubit interactions than two qubit interactions. But there are some perturbation gadgets that you can turn two qubit, three qubit interaction to two qubit interactions. Uh, I don't want to go through this perturbation gadget details, but it turns out that if you have xx, xz, and zz and xz coupling, it's enough actually to uh, the realize uh, universal Hamiltonian. And it was actually shown by Yeah, shown by uh, Bayamonte and, and Peter Love, I, I think. These are details of perturbation gadgets. Yeah. It was shown by Bayamonte and, and, and Love that only, even XZ is only enough. If you have XZ coupler, it's enough to, to, to form, a, uh, to have a universal Hamiltonian, assuming that the D and H have both, can have both signs, plus and minus sign. So, as to answering you how far you are, you, you, you need two elements. So we, we have ZZ coupler, we have Z, we have X, we don't have XX. If we add XX couplers, and we make you it so that D can have both signs, plus and minus sign, we will have a, a universal quantum computer. But these are not easy things to do. Uh, these are doable, but, but hard things to do. More questions? So, actually, I wonder if you could please comment on, because uh, we have both experience, what's the difference between doing research at the university and research in a high tech company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one, one difference I tell you, told you yesterday, so uh, the, the, uh, whatever theory I, I, I derive and uh, prediction I make the next day is, is in the lab and tested, so I, I have to make sure that <laughs> the, all the assumptions and everything is, is correct. But it's, it's, it's also a joy, like you, the, the, you develop a theory and you make a prediction. A lot of experiments we did, it was already predicted and we had a theory model prediction the experiment I showed you the, uh, previously, the, the temperature and how temperature helps. We had actually a paper and we, we, we theoretically predicted and we had the model and then, then the experiment confirmed that. It's also a joy. And, but at the same time, it's, it's, uh, it has its own uh, stress and difficulty and how, uh, having a hard time to publish papers because some people don't like us. And <laughs> It's, it's, it's both ways, but I, 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 I'm actually very grateful to be in TV. So, um, how about uh, you know, proofs of speed-ups or what's happening there? That is my talk today. Okay, okay so, so that's that. good motivation to come for the seminar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? Yes, so the interface you get to the quantum computer is through MATLAB, is that correct? Uh, I think you have MATLAB, C, and Python at this time. So you can use anything? You can use it, yeah. MATLAB, C, and Python. And so you send the command to the, to the computer, and does it take some time to prepare anything, or is it basically... It is pretty fast. Is it already set up, so everything is already frozen, and so what happens is, you, because you are not the only, the only user of this computer, like uh, usually uh, tens of people are, are sitting on the side. So what happens is when you send your command, it goes to a queue, mm -hmm. goes to the computer, gives a solution, comes back, but this is very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, Please. Just um, a curiosity answer. What, uh, what does 
Okay, that, that's a, the historically interesting question. Uh, what we started doing was to, to make a, a gate model quantum computation based on a D-wave superconductor. And so what, you know, we now neither doing gate model nor doing D-wave, so <laughs> the, the name is still, is still a state. And the, the, another interesting about being in, in a company is you really have to be realistic. And you cannot, uh, you know, a company cannot survive for a long time un unless you really have some progress, real progress. And so we, we started working on D-Wave superconductors uh, and uh, so very soon we realized that, you know, this is nothing that, that we can rely on as, as a technology. It's a, a very good, interesting scientific thing to do, but as a technology, it's, and we just switched. And then we, gave, we went to, to S-Wave. And then we were working on gate model, and then we realized this is also nothing to, to rely on as a technology in the short term. You know, a company cannot survive at, uh, for 50 years based on investors' model. So you have to, to come up with some way that, that get a, a, a result in a short duration of time. And then we, we, we had to switch to, to adiabatic quantum computation and the quantum annealing, and that's what that we ended up. But the name is stayed. But, but the, the collaborators that we had uh, working on D-Wave, they are still working on D-Wave. And uh, they're making good progress, but I don't think that's a direction for a, a technology to go. Sure, no problem. Sure.